welcome everyone to this um, uh, workshop on trajectory inference uh, across condition differential expression and differential progression. Um, so it will be given by uh, Kelly Street, uh, Kung van den Berge and Hector Rudebissier. And uh, with that, I will just hand over to the workshop leaders to tell you how they will structure the, the session and so on. So take it away. Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to be taking it in turns to go through uh, just a few different ideas that we've been working on related to downstream analysis in trajectory inference and differential expression in that sort of regime. Trajectory inference across conditions. So that's the basic idea of this talk. We're going to be uh, talking about how to handle multiple conditions, uh, such as case control or mutant wild type, uh, so categorical conditions when dealing with single cell trajectory inference. Um, this all started with, uh, as you can see, a GitHub issue that had quite a, a good conversation under it. Um, and yeah, this whole project has, has really grown and gone in some very interesting directions from there. So here is just to get you started, an example data set uh, of the kind that we're going to be working with here. So this is a really good data set for the problem that we're trying to illustrate. Um, it's uh, cells that were grown in culture to uh, transition from this epithelial cell type to mesenchymal. This is a well-known uh, type of transition. So it's a very simple type of lineage or trajectory. It's just one cell type turning into another cell type. And so you can see these, these green cells at the middle of the cell culture sort of uh, divide and, and multiply and turn into these blue cells on the periphery. And then the cells were collected in two different locations, uh, inside that red circle and outside that red circle. And so in general, you tend to get more of the early epithelial cells on the inner collection and more of the later mesenchymal cells on that outer collection. Uh, this experiment was run twice, once in a control setting and once where the cells were treated with this TGF beta factor. And what we're interested in exploring is the ways in which this treatment affected that linear transition. So this is some stuff that we just sort of have to get out of the way. Um, obviously, a lot of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is very downstream of a lot of the more basic single cell analyses. And so we're using Surratt's SC transform for normalization. Uh, and then we're also using their, uh, the new Surratt V3 integration method for integrating the two different batches. So obviously these batches were collected separately, the treatment and control. And so we have to do some sort of correction for that. Um, we're not necessarily endorsing these methods, but we found them to yield pretty good results on this data that we're going to be showing you. And then we're going to use Slingshot for trajectory inference, which I will cover very briefly uh, when we actually get to our workflow. So one of the first ideas that we've sort of explored in this work is differential topology. Um, we want to see do we have the same structure in our two conditions? And so if you look uh, on the top row of figures there, A and B, you can see we've got two different cases. Um, we've got one where condition A and B have more or less the same topology. They're both a linear transition. And then we've got a second case where they have very different topologies. Both of them are still a linear transition, but it's not the same pattern that we see in both conditions. Um, and this sort of determines, you know, answering this question determines how we approach uh, our downstream analyses. And so this is an important early uh, question that we want to ask in any of these analyses is, do we see the same pattern? Do we see, see the same topology in different conditions? Um, when we do see similar topologies, then we can answer questions of, well, how are the cells progressing through these topologies or through these uh, trajectories? And this can be an interesting question because 
now we're working in a similar framework for our two cases or multiple cases. Um, and so we've got basically a common axis along which we can compare things. And so here you can see we're comparing distributions of cells along a single pseudo time axis from the mock and the TGF beta treated conditions. And you can see that there are differences in those distributions. And those differences are interesting because they indicate some effect of that treatment. And then finally, uh, sort of the most uh, nuanced analysis that we do is looking at differential expression, uh, both between and within these conditions. And so this is something that we've worked on a lot with TradeSeq, where we might be comparing different branches of, a same, of the same trajectory. Now we might be comparing two conditions in the same branch of a trajectory and trying to determine the difference between, say, a treated and control group um, along a single uh, lineage. This could also be used um, for within a condition, uh, comparing different branches of a trajectory. And so this is a sort of a natural extension of a lot of the work that we've done with TradeSeq before. We just added a conditions variable that allows for these more uh, interesting comparisons. Um, and so we want to thank you all for participating. Uh, please feel free to follow up with any questions. Um, we've got very active GitHub repos for both Slingshot and TradeSeq, uh, both over 100 issues, for better or for worse. We, we choose to take the optimistic view of it. That means people are engaging with our software. The imbalance scores and differential progression work that we're going to be presenting here will soon be available in Bioconductor. Um, hopefully in time for spring. And we're still looking for more data sets to benchmark these methods on. So if you have any suggestions, we are very open to that. And so with that, I'm going to transition over to our uh, workflow. So if you go to our homepage here, um, I'm going to be presenting the trajectory inference across conditions, uh, differential expression, differential progression article and that'll be our full workflow document. I did a quick intro to our data set earlier, um, but it is that data set from the McFallon Figueroa et al. study, uh, looking at epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Um, and it's a very good, sort of very clean example of a single lineage in two conditions. And it allows us to demonstrate a lot of the, the tools that we've developed. Uh, as I mentioned briefly, we do have to worry about integrating the different batches here. Since we've got uh, two batches, there might be some sort of batch effects that we're not particularly interested in. We want to compare these, we want to make these uh, things as comparable as possible so that we're really just seeing the effect of the treatment. And so we use uh, Surat's V3 integration for that. And here's the code for that. We don't actually run this in our document or in our uh, uh, Docker. Um, we just sort of have the results stored in the data object. Um, but in case you were interested in how we did that, here is how we did that. Um, here is how you can import the data directly from our BioC 2020 trajectories package. Um, and so then, like I said, the first big question that we're interested in is, do we see the same topology across these different conditions? Um, this is important because if we do see, you know, very different trajectories between our treated and control conditions, then these things aren't necessarily comparable. We don't necessarily want to create a single trajectory that describes both of them, but rather fit separate trajectories. Uh, but in this case, you can see that we have very good overlap between the two conditions. Uh, they seem to be following very similar patterns. And so we're fairly confident in fitting a single unified trajectory to this data and not having to worry about fitting one for mock and one for TGF beta. That brings us uh, to the imbalance scores, which we showed on that slide earlier. So right now, this is just implemented in our BioC 2020 trajectories package, but this will be part of whatever package we end up developing uh, to get some of these ideas out there. But this is one of the, the core functions, I would say, for this work. Um, and it's basically a, a community 
a neighborhood uh, diversity score. It's looking at local neighborhoods of the data in some reduced dimensional space. In this case, we're using a UMAP dimensionality reduction. And it's looking for does the distribution of cases in this neighborhood match the distribution of cases in the overall data set. And so if a particular local neighborhood has more, say, TGF beta cells than the overall data set, that would create an imbalance. Um, that would be indicative of an imbalance. And so uh, higher scores indicate more imbalance, lower scores indicate less imbalance, meaning better agreement between those neighborhoods and the overall distribution of the cases. And we had a smoothing step, which is why this picture looks so nice. Um, there's a few regions of yellow and orange that you can see in there that are indicative of imbalance. But for the most part, what we see is a lot of purple, um, a lot of low scores. I shouldn't be saying colors in particular because your results may vary. But we see a lot of low scores um, that sort of agree with our intuition uh, from looking at the earlier plot that there's not a huge topological difference between these two cases. And so again, that just uh, allows us to feel confident in fitting a single common trajectory to these two cases. Okay. And to that end, um, this is how we fit that trajectory. As I said in the intro slides, we're using Slingshot to do trajectory inference. And I think this is a, a somewhat clever usage. Um, we usually require an upstream clustering step before running Slingshot uh, and then construct a minimum spanning tree on those clusters. However, in this case, we leveraged the fact that we have two different collections, inner and outer, to basically take the place of clusters in this data. So we don't actually do any clustering step. We just use the labels inner and outer, referring to which collection those cells came from. And we treat those labels as if they were clusters. And this allows us to get basically the one bit of information that we need, which is directionality. Because we know that in general, the inner cells are going to fall earlier in pseudo time than the outer cells. And so we can make uh, as you see down here, a minimum spanning tree with only two clusters, inner and outer, and we set the inner cluster as the beginning. And that allows us to fit this single trajectory. And we know that it has the correct orientation because we set the inner uh, collection as the beginning. And so here's that nice uniform single trajectory uh, that we're going to use as our, our common reference for both conditions. And so now what we have is a pseudo time value for every cell along this one trajectory. And the next question, sort of the most basic question that we can try to answer next is, do we see the same progression along that trajectory in both conditions? So this is that plot that I showed earlier. Um, we take the pseudo time axis, and then we look at distributions of cells in both the mock and TGF beta treated conditions. And we see that there is a slight difference here, and it's not terribly surprising. Um, it does fit with uh, what we know to be the effects of the TGF beta treatment. Uh, it sort of accelerates the whole thing. And so we see more of the later time points in the TGF beta treated condition than we do in the mock, which is this nice trimodal distribution. Um, and if we want to test for differences between these two uh, distributions, we can do that with a kolmogorov smirnov test, which is really just a test for, you know, do these come from the same distribution or are these two different distributions? And as you might expect from looking at the density plots, we get a very significant p-value. I don't know why it's not showing up here. But if you run this KS test, uh, you should get a very small p-value. We have a question in the questions. In the yeah, perfect. Do you want me to read that? Or, uh, sure. So for the, uh, oh, we have two questions now. For the differential progression, rather than the KS test, could we use the distinct package method to look at the difference in the distributions of the pseudotime between the two conditions? 
The distinct package method was presented in this conference to look for differences in continuous distribution. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like it. Okay. I, I think it's possible, but I, I also think here we're only comparing like one sample, you could say, per group. Uh, so the Kolmogorov Smirnov test is okay. Uh, and, and I think the distinct method was more referring to comparing groups of samples between each other. Right. But as, 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 as soon as we have that, I, I mean, if, if, if we would have, say, two different samples in each condition, then I think using a distinct method could be a good alternative. We don't have any no. more questions okay. for now. OK, let me proceed to, to go to the differential expression. I'll, I'll first start a poll to see if you're able to run the code on the cloud and to see if um, we should maybe try and help some people out. So if, if not, I suggest you maybe reach out to one of the chairs in the, in the session, and I'm sure they should be able to help you out. Yeah, maybe you can write a, a, you know, a few lines in the feed, and we can try to help. Great. Thanks, Davide. Um, so I'll be running the code interactively also on the cloud. Um, <clears throat> So you should be able to see my screen now. So what we've done until now really looks at more kind of uh, global um, patterns along this uh, axis uh, we're studying, along this epithelial to mesenchymal transition axis. And we've, we've seen that once, uh, so when cells were treated with TGF-beta, they seem to develop uh, faster as compared to the mock control because they're Pseudo time density is kind of shifted towards higher values. Um, what we'll done, what we'll do in this differential expression uh, section is is a more kind of specific analysis, looking at individual genes and seeing how they are behaving along the trajectory and um, between the different conditions. So what we'll be using to do that is a package we've been developing called TradeSeq. And what TradeSeq does for you really is that it estimates uh, smooth average gene expression uh, profiles along this uh, pseudo time axis we are looking at. And then it, it's, it's able to use the smooth functions to look at which genes are involved in specific lineages of the trajectory and which genes are involved differentially between different lineages or between different conditions within uh, a specific lineage. Um, <clears throat> so here we will be fitting uh, a smooth average expression profile for each condition. So one for the control condition and one for a TGF beta treated cells. Um, and internally, TradeSeq uses a, an active binomial uh, model to estimate the smooth functions. And we are relying on the MGCV package, which is an R package that fits these uh, GAM models for you. So it's a very powerful uh, package developed by Simon Wood. So he deserves a lot of credit for the implementations here. Um, so if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about these motors and how they how these work, we've provided a link here in the vignette that um, directs you to Simon Wood's homepage, and there's an, an MGCV page where he lists a couple of uh, presentations and, uh, and short course material, etc., et on smoothing and how it is implemented in the MGCV package. So, if you're interested in that, I can really recommend it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we want to estimate these smooth functions, and, and one of the first decisions we'll have to make is how complex are the functions we would like to estimate. Um, so smoothers work with this concept, which is called knots. And, and the basic thing is that if the more knots you have, the more complex uh, patterns you will be able to estimate. But you will also be, have to estimate uh, more parameters. Uh, so there's kind of a trade-off between uh, being able to capture more complex patterns, but also uh, limiting the, the complexity of your model. Um, in order to help you with that, we've got a, a function which we're calling evaluate k. Um, what you feed into that is the, the gene expression count, so genes in the rows, cells in the columns. The pseudo time and the cell weights are, is, is really what's provided by the trajectory inference, uh, so by slingshot. 
which is the part Kelly ran us through. You've got a, a conditions argument. So if your data set like here consists of multiple conditions, you can provide that here. And in the evaluate K function, we are really looking at a random subset of genes. And here it's 300 genes. And um, checking how well the model fits over a range of different knots. So here we check how well the model fits uh, for a, a range of knots from three to seven. Uh, so this, since we are fitting the models for these genes over a different range of knots, this function could take a while. So we've provided the, the output you'll get here in the PNG. Um, so it gives you four panels. Let me go down. So on the x-axis of each panel is the number of knots. So it's from three to seven. And on the y-axis for the first panel, it's uh, so, so for every gene, you've got an AIC value. So the lower the AIC, the better the model fits. For every one of those knot points which we're looking at. So in the first panel, you take the AIC of the gene and you subtract the mean AIC over this range of knots, and we make box plots of that. And, and what you can see is, for example, when you fit using only three knots, the AIC is typically quite a bit higher than the average AIC over this range of knots. So it's probably a good idea to go with more knots. It starts to kind of, you know, the decrease starts to decrease kind of uh, at, at five knots, although for some genes, for example, seven knots still fits a little bit better than five knots. So this decision to make is, is kind of uh, subjective, but we really have found that um, as long as the number of knots isn't um, extremely small or extremely high, it shouldn't matter too much. And for most data sets, the reasonable range in, in our experience is between four and eight knots. Um, the second panel is the average AIC across all the genes, and we can see that it goes down quite steeply from three to five knots, and then you know the decrease starts attenuating a little bit. This is the relative AIC, a very similar pattern. And on the right panel, we select, so it, it's a bar plot um, where we focus on which amount of knots fits best for uh, a particular number of genes. So for example, for most genes, seven knots actually fits best. Um, so as I said, this is kind of an arguable decision you could make, which uh, doesn't have a huge impact. And here we have really chosen five knots because we focusing on these, especially these first couple of panels that seem to be a reasonable choice, but it's, you might have well picked six. Uh, okay, so once we have selected the number of knots we would like to use, um, <clears throat> we can fit this mood uh, these smoothers using uh, GAMS. So this works using the fit GAM function where the input is very similar to what we've seen in evaluate K. So it's gene expression. The trajectory uh, kind of inputs uh, the conditions variable, which is the mock in a TGF beta. And now we're saying we want to fit the model using five knots. Um, <clears throat> Again, we're skipping this in this workshop because it takes a while to run on the cloud. Um, but the results to fit this are actually stored in the SCE object that goes with the package. Um, so after you fit, it might be a good idea to check um, whether the model has converged for most of the genes. So there's um, this is stored in the metadata. We store a, a variable which we call converged. And we can see that for, um, the total of 10,500 genes, it converges for most of them. So there's, um, let's check for how many genes it, so it didn't converge for about seven genes. So if, if you're seeing a fishy result for one of the genes you're looking at, it might be worth checking whether the, the model for your specific gene has actually converged. Um, okay. So now that we've fitted these models, we can think about doing inference and actually answering interesting biological questions. Um, in a differential expression part, we've split it up in two. And the first section looks at assessing differential expression along pseudo time. Um, or in this case, it's, it could also be pseudo space because the cells are actually migrating 
um, along space. Um, so in this first section, we are looking at differential expression within each of the lineages. So the um, trajectory actually only consists of one lineage, but we perform differential expression within each of the conditions for that one lineage. So for each condition, we will check which genes are doing something along pseudo time uh, for that specific lineage. We do that using the association test, um, which is a test that basically tests the null hypothesis that gene expression is not a function of pseudo time. So it basically tries to figure out whether the estimated smoothers are varying significantly as a function of pseudo time for each of the conditions. Um, the association test uses as input the SCE object U that was uh, generated by FitGam. Uh, we've got a, an argument which we're calling lineages equals true, which does the pairwise, uh, which does the condition specific comparisons for you. So if you set lineages is true, you'll get the results for each of the conditions separately. So you'll get results for the control conditions and also for the TGF beta condition. If you set this to false, it will do one global test across both conditions. So it will just look for genes doing something in any of the conditions. Or if you have multiple lineages, it will be any of the lineages. Um, I think can we, we have a question that could be good to answer now, which is um, how sensitive are the result, for example, the association test to the number of knots? If yeah, I, yeah I, I think that's a really good question. And, and this is something we've actually in, investigated in our paper. Um, so they are not super sensitive to the number of knots is what we have found. As long as the knots are in a reasonable range, um, they are not super sensitive to that, or they should not be super sensitive to that. And to, to add up what reasonable range might mean, um, the the smallest value you can get for the number of knots is three, uh, and we found that it's usually too small. Uh, but anything above three and below ten uh, would be considered reasonable. Yeah, in our experience. Okay, so once we run the association test, uh, this is how the results should look like. Um, <clears throat> So here we've got a total of 10 columns. The first three give you results for what we're calling a global test. So this is always across all the different lineages or all the different conditions in your data set, uh, where the evidence is aggregated across all these different groups. And then we'll have uh, results if lineages is equal to true. We'll have results for every specific lineage or every specific condition. So we've got wall test statistics for the mock condition, degrees of freedom, and the p-value corresponding to the tests. And the same for the TGF beta condition. And we've also got a column with the average log full change. <clears throat> so what we'll be doing now is that we'll be um, adjusting the p-values uh, and FDR control adjustment, and we'll be calling mock genes and TGF beta genes, the set of genes which have um, an, an FDR value below 5% after p-value collection, uh, p-value adjustment. So if we compare the set of genes, so first of all, we see that, um, let me see. It. So there is about a thousand Significant, thousand significant genes for the TGF beta condition, and there's about almost 2,500 genes for the control condition. We've got way more genes doing something along pseudo time in the mock condition than in the TGF beta condition, um, with a significant uh, fold change, and that's higher than two or lower than half. For the TGF beta condition, most of the genes we can see are actually shared with the mock condition. There's a limited number of genes uniquely uh, doing something in the TGF beta condition. And then obviously we've got a bunch of genes unique uh, to the control condition. So if 
if you want to visualize these genes, one visualization um, I particularly like is that we actually visualize the average smoothed gene expression profile we have estimated. And if you want to do that, we have uh, implemented this function, which we're calling predict smooth, which um, returns the estimated smoother for you for a specific set of genes you're interested in. The endpoints argument is, is telling you how many grid points you like um, the estimated smoother to be returned on. And then we've got a tidy argument, which if, if you set to true, it gives you a tidy data frame, which might be useful for ggplot2 users. So here, tidy is equal to false. So, so what we'll be getting is a, a matrix um, where 2,400 genes is the, the number of genes that were significant in the mock condition. And we had a grid of 50 points for each of the conditions. So in total, we've got 50 columns. And then what we do is that we, we scale the data for each gene uh, to have zero mean and unit standard deviation. And we only select the first 50 columns, which means that we only look at the mock condition. Um, so we can make a heat map of that, where the um, columns are not clustered. So they're uh, indicative of the uh, pseudo time axis, but the rows are clustered. So the different genes are clustered according to their average uh, gene expression profile. And we can see that these kind of groups of genes are starting to pop up where some genes are highly expressed at the beginning and others are highly expressed at the end. And some are kind of more uh, expressed in the intermediate phases or the mid late phases. Um, so if you'd like to use this kind of clustering as, as to, to group genes and maybe do functional enrichment or downstream analyses of these, one easy way we have provided here is that you can actually use the hierarchical tree from the heat map and you can cut it to, to make different clusters. So here we are extracting the tree from the heat map and we are cutting it into six different clusters, um, which gives us these six different groups of genes you might want to investigate. Um, the code below is something we will not run because it takes a while, but really it's, a, it's something very similar where we are plotting the fitted values of each individual cell rather than the estimated moon smooth, mean smoothers. So finally, if you want to, if you want to interpret this set of mock genes, we will do a gene set enrichment analysis. Um, so here we are using the gene sets provided by the MCDB consortium. Uh, we're looking at mouse data. We are selecting the uh, hallmark gene sets provided by MCDB. And we are interested in biological processes. Um, so here we are doing one of the many tools that are available to do gene set en enrichment analysis. So we're using an R package called FGSEA, which is stands for fast gene set enrichment. Um, and we are using the wall statistics provided by the association test as a kind of um, measure of evidence um, for each individual genes. Because it, it does quite a few permutations, this might take a few seconds to run. So if there is so any can, question. Maybe, maybe, yeah, exactly. Maybe I will read out loud the question that I asked in the Q&A <laughs> since the, in the meantime. Uh, so can you comment on the biological interpretation of the mock condition, that the fact that the mock condition has more significant genes than the actual condition, the TFG, uh, I forgot the name of the gene. But. Yeah, the TGF. So, so you know, I'm obviously not an expert in the system. We are, you know, we are we're just reusing, we're being data parasite, research parasites and reusing the data that was published. Um, so I, I'm not really sure what's the reasoning behind it. I think the authors actually found a similar thing. Um, but maybe the fact that uh, these cells are developing faster along development might mean that they are being pushed faster into something and, and skipping some kind of cell state. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just you know a, a wild guess. So thanks.
Okay, this should finish pretty soon. Okay, I would have thought this goes faster. Maybe I can just show you the results in the HTML. So when we do the gene set enrichment analysis, the, the top gene sets we'll be looking at is uh, quite a few gene sets related to cell cycle, but we also see since this is reemerges is the epithelial to mesenchymal transition. We, we see some pretty interesting gene sets related to epithelium development, epithelial cell differentiation, skin development, etc. So the, the gene sets that come out of this, at least on our based on our superficial biological understanding of the system, seem to make sense. Um, so I'll stop this and move to the next. Okay, so in the next section, we'll um, take it one step further. And instead of looking at the data within each of the conditions separately, we'll compare gene expression between the different conditions. Um, so as a kind of warm up, we've uh, we will be plotting a few of the genes that are described in the manuscript. So one of the uh, results the authors had that CDH1 and CRB3 are two genes that should be expressed in, in kind of similar kinetics. Uh, so in TradeSeq, we've got this function which we call plot smoothers, which allows you to plot the, the fitted model. And we indeed see that both of these genes kind of are higher expressed in the early stages, so in the inner phase of the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and decrease in expression as pseudotime goes on. Um, <clears throat> also, the FN1 and CDH2 genes were two genes that were um, discussed in the paper. And we see that both of these genes are kind of upregulated in the TGF beta condition. So this is a CDH2 gene, and this is even more clear for the FN1 gene, which is where there is a, you know, a very high amount of differential expression between the two conditions. So if you want to kind of formalize uh, such an analysis and uh, do it in an unsupervised way where we don't really have to look at every individual genes, we have developed a test which we're calling for now the condition test because it compares different conditions within each of the lineages. Um, <clears throat> so what the condition test will do is that it will check for both differences in, in average expression between the two conditions, but also differences in expression pattern between the conditions. Um, again, you can do it for every pairwise uh, comparison of conditions, but we, since we only have two conditions here, there's really only one pairwise condition, pairwise comparison to be made. Um, and we we also allow again for full change cutoff. So here, the log two full change cutoff is at log two of two. So we require a full change of at least two or lower than fifty percent. And I'll just wait a few seconds until this finishes. I hope it goes faster than a gene set arrangement analysis, but it should. If there are any questions in the meanwhile, we, now would be a good time, but I guess not. I'll switch to the HTML until it finished running. Well, maybe I have another question, but uh, I was hesitant to ask it because I, I was distracted with other things, and maybe you already said it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, can you tell me? Can you tell us a little more details on the on these tests that you do? How how do you actually test that null hypothesis? Uh, like, what's so, the test statistics, and how do you get the the p value? So the, the, the smoothers are, are kind of parameterized using basis function expansions. So we, we use a set of, uh, in this case, cubic regression basis functions uh, to, to estimate the smoothers. <coughs> and so every, every one of those basis functions uh, has got a, a coefficient which determines its, its contribution to the estimated smoother at, at specific locations. 
And so, so what we're doing in, for example, the condition test is that we are directly comparing these, um, these estimated uh, mean expression functions over a grid of points. Um, so so you, there, there is um, an, an argument, again, called endpoints here, mm -hmm. which we don't use. And, and you can compare, for example, 20 points along pseudo time between the two uh, conditions. And then it does an, an omnibus test on that. We have a I mean, question. Yeah, I guess there. it's a related question by Michael Stadler. Uh, can you give an intuition of what the hypothesis the test is testing? So here, the hypothesis is that, um, so the null hypothesis here in this case, um, it would be that the two smoothers are identical between conditions. So the smoother of condition one would be equal to the smoother of condition two. And, and that, that goes for both the, the average expression, but also for the patterns. So since this is, again, taking longer than I expected, I'll um, move to the HTML. And so if, if we run this, what we should see is that we have about 2,000 genes where we have differential expression uh, between the two conditions on an FDR level of uh, 5%. Um, so just to show you, if you visualize the most significant gene and the least significant gene, this is the most significant gene. And, you know, we can see indeed very clear evidence of differential expression. And this is the least significant gene where we indeed see that there's no differential expression. And in fact, there's barely any expression at all between uh, over both of these conditions. So again, we can... Uh, visualize these results. And right now we've got two heat maps because we want to compare the two different conditions. So in all the rows here are the 2000 genes we found to be differentially expressed between the two conditions. And again, the columns uh, refer to a, a grid of pseudo time points uh, with 50 points along the grid. Um, and we can see, for example, that there is a set of genes which was highly upregulated in the mock condition at the start, but it isn't at all in the TGF beta condition. And groups of genes that actually do the, the reverse. Um, so this is, again, a way you can use to group your genes or explore the results. And then as a final analysis, we again do a gene set enrichment analysis for the genes differentially expressed between these conditions, and we see that um, the pathways that are upregulated or the gene sets that are upregulated are on cell adhesion and cell motility. And these turn out to be processes that are actually uh, used in this epithelial to mesenchymal transition where cells actually you know, migrate to the, uh, to the mesenchyme. And you know, things like cell motility and cell adhesion are um, things that make sense in such a scenario. Okay, I think that covers it, uh, covers the differential expression part. And unless there's any questions, I think we are ready for another toy example where we'll have a, a, a relaxed finish of the workshop, I would say. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Kun. Um, I hope my connection holds because it's been kind of a bit unstable. Uh, please stop me if it's starting to break down. Uh, we just wanted to do, um, since what we've been working on is kind of uh, very new and kind of we're still working on getting an established workflow, uh, just giving you a second overview of a much uh, funnier example, at least less serious, uh, of kind of the workflow we have in mind in this kind of settings. And so, as an example, I'm going to take the advent calendar that I've been eating uh, with my girlfriend over the last uh, few days. And the big question we have, of course, with an advent calendar is how are you going to decide who eats the chocolate on a given day? Because it's impossible to cut a, cho a hot chocolate uh, in two in completely equal sizes, and we both want the chocolate daily. So we've decided to do odd and even days, but uh, the big question we have is, is it still fair? And so we're going to use this advent calendar as kind of a mock example. So you can also actually load the data. Uh, 
in our BIOC 2020 trajectory package. Uh, and so for every single day, you have the position in the calendar. So X and Y being uh, the usual axis in the calendar. And then you have the weight of every piece of chocolate and the percentage of cocoa in uh, every piece of chocolate. And so kind of our workflow uh, that Kieran Kelly just presented, but in kind of a more condensed way is the first thing we do is differential topology. And as we talked about, differential topology is, do we have the same repartition of cells uh, in the reduced dimension? And so here we're gonna look at, do we have the same repartition of the odd or even slots in the calendar? And so if we plot it and we call it by whether it's a even or odd day, uh, it's kind of hard to know if it's completely random or not. Um, we can use the imbalance score that we developed. Uh, it's not really appropriate for 24 samples. Um, so this is not at all the statistical analysis I would recommend in, in general, if you wanted to test it for those 24, but just uh, we can do it here still, it works. Uh, here is the code, so it's very similar to the one used in the more serious vignette. The only difference being that we have to tweak a little bit the definition of the neighborhood because there is so few days in December. So the, the second step of the workflow we talked about, um, if you can fit a common trajectory uh, on the single cell or anything data is this differential progression. Here, we all share the same timeline, which is the days. So it's easy to decide what's gonna be the x-axis. And that plot, but you can plot, basically this is just the density plot of the number of odd and even days. Uh, in a month. So as you expect, they're going to be pretty similar density plots and just being biased by the fact that the first day is an odd month, uh, odd day, sorry, and the last day, the 24th, is even. But if you actually want to compare those two distribution and you test them using the Morganov similar test, uh, you do find not significant result, which is kind of expected. So in a real data set, that would be when we compare the further time distribution between the two conditions for every single lineage, and you want to see do the cell uh, develop faster or at least differently along the lineage. Uh, and in the TGF beta example that uh, Kelly presented, we actually had differential progression. And then the third step in the workflow, so after we've done differential topology and differential progression. Yeah, so here you, uh, you could do it in a more rigorous uh, statistical manner, but you would have, um, you would compare so the green uh, or the purple smoother to a constant one, and that would be the equivalent of the association test, uh, wondering whether the average chocolate weight is constant across the days. And then you could also contrast the green and the purple smoothers one to the other, and wonder whether uh, they are different between the odd and the even days. And that would be the condition test. So here in both uh, settings, there is no uh, differential expression. The weight of the chocolate is kind of equally balanced across the days and between the odd and the even days. However, if we look at the percentage of uh, cocoa in each of the chocolates here, uh, so here we've got, once again, a green and a purple smoother. Um, and so if you want to compare um, each smoother individually to an average, just an average expression, uh, you would not be able to differentiate them statistically. So if you were to do an association test, you would not get significant result. However, if you were to contrast the two smoothers, the purple to the green, uh, you would find that it's actually differentially expressed and that the person that has a uh, chocolate on the even days actually get a different amount of cocoa compared to the odd days. Uh, and since I was the one that was having the chocolate on the eve on the odd days, sorry, I actually had uh, more cocoa in the chocolate, which is perfect. For me. <laughs> uh, and just to show you that it actually is a real calendar, uh, this I've seen John yeah, question. I think um, I would yeah. not comment on whether I've actually waited for real every single piece of chocolate. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but can you answer Charlotte's question though? No, I did not open everything. 
uh, I would have been heavily judged by my girlfriend if I had to. I was already <laughs> very puzzled when I went to take a picture of the event calendar while she was on the call. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of uh, both the serious and non serious part of the workshop. Um, but if you still have questions, uh, we still have, I think, half an hour nearly. So, yeah, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, you know, and I think if you if you in the audience have like used trade seek in general, I think the the you know other aspects of trade seek package or uh, you know trajectory analysis in general, I think the speakers would be happy to answer those as well. <laughs> and in the meantime, I think one question that came up a few times when we discussed. Well, the fact that when we when you sequence the two conditions, you, it's going to be two different batches, and a little bit of suspense and what that yeah. means. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, talk, I'll talk later. <laughs> well, you can try and finish it now. Yeah, I was saying there's the balance of normalizing the batch when you do integration, but also not like the two batches are actually distinct biological signal, and so this is a problem that has no easy solution, just something to keep in mind um, when you do this normalization. Yeah, kind of the worst possible design of the experiment. Mm. Well, I guess the only possible also in this particular case, but uh, yeah. So I think we, since we have uh, time, if you prefer to uh, ask questions like, um, you know, by voice, you can also raise your hand and we can uh, Add you on screen. There's one question in the Q&A. Yeah, so nice talk. In the first example, you use the UMAP dimensions to calculate the trajectories with slingshot. Wouldn't something like a diffusion map be better? I can, I can take that. Um, we're sort of, we're, we're not saying that like everything we did here is, is the best possible way to do this. Um, it's just sort of a, a way that, that worked well for us on this particular data set. Um, so it very well could be the case that on different data sets, or even on this data set, a diffusion map would have worked better. Um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't think we tried diffusion maps. Um, I've seen I've seen them work well, and I've seen them not work well, which is true for pretty much every dimensionality reduction technique. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's why that's why slingshot is designed to be agnostic to choice of dimensionality reduction. Sounds like the perfect description of every bioinformatic method. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, we have one. Are there examples or scenarios where trade seek might not work the best? Um, probably. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, obviously, you really need to. So, so one of the, the things we are still kind of struggling with with TradeSeq, and, and that's, I, I would say, is an important limitation, is that if we, if we want to compare the, the expression between different lineages, but the lineages have different lengths, then you, know, you, you kind of got to figure out a way how to map one lineage to the other. And, and right now, we are, we are taking a very simple approach where we are basically you could say linearly extending the, the, the shorter lineage um, and, and then comparing them directly. Um, but, but there's probably better ways to do that. Um, you've got methods that to, for example, dynamic time warping to map one lineage onto another. Um, mm -hmm. And those could be definitely interesting things to, to look at. So that's definitely one of the limitations where, um, yeah we're struggling with right now or looking at. I think also runtime is a bit of yeah. a problem. We've had uh, users come up with cases, especially where you have uh, two or three conditions, more than 10 lineages, uh, and they want to try not up to like 10 to 12, and that means you have to estimate about 120 very correlated parameters for every gene. And that can be very, very long. Um, so speed up of the methods and to 
to like the very complex situations is definitely on our radar. So are you are you uh, parallelizing this process or um, is it just a sequence like a single core? So it is implemented to be able to parallelize. Um, but we, we also find that sometimes it gives issues for some people. We're using the BIOC parallel package to parallelize it across the genes. So there's another question. In your experience, what is the minimum number of cells do you need to successfully run TradeSeq? Um, so I, I think that's a really good question. And, and it, I think it very much depends on the data set you're looking at, because if 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 you're if if the patterns you're you're having biologically are are pretty simple patterns, then you you would not need a lot of cells to estimate these patterns. But if if the patterns are are pretty complex, you would need you know quite a lot more cells. So yeah, I, I find it hard to give like a, a minimum number of cells because I think it it really depends on the system you're looking at and and how complex these patterns are. Um, in, in, in the paper, we do have one case study, for example, where we look at uh, a bulk RNA-seq time course data set, where you only have, um, I believe, six time points. Um, and obviously, the patterns you estimate then are, are very simple. So if, if yeah, again, if, if it's simple patterns, you might get away with a lower number of cells. But and then another question, are the results sensitive to sequencing uh, UMI depth differences? I guess across condition. Um, so, so what we are using internally, we are normalizing for the uh, sequencing depth differences using uh, TMM normalization from HR. Um, so we should correct for that. But you know, it, it's obviously just a, a scaling normalization, estimating one scaling factor for for each cell, which also has its limitations. That you know, uh, the uh, Oh, okay. So maybe it was my fault. I misunderstood, I misunderstood the question. So um, the uh, person that has the question meant uh, SmartSeq2 versus 10x genomics, for example. So I'm not sure if this is actually about the entire workflow. Or Do you want to um, raise your hand and come on stage and, and maybe you can um, give more details on the question? Oh, but I guess, uh, Charlotte, you are the host. Oh, I just meant like, do you find that you get better results if you have higher sequencing depth or mean reads per cell as opposed to a shallower sequencing? And do you find that your conditional analysis is very sensitive to that? Because I've often been told that you need really good sequencing depth to get reliable pseudo time trajectory analysis. So I just wonder, did you find that your results were very sensitive if you looked at the conditional progressional differences with like high depth data sets as opposed to shallower data sets. Thank you. I, I think uh, you did a much better job at asking the question than I, <laughs> I did. <laughs> so Kun, do we want to tackle this? I, I think SmartSeq2 data sets are useful, but in, in my experience, they are, they are also kind of noisy. Uh, and in, in my limited experience, um, I, I actually like working with more cells, but at a more shallow sequencing that, but you know, for, for other applications, the other data set might work well. Uh, we, we have, for now, only worked with um, droplet-based data sets with, with shallow sequencing depth with, with UMIs. Um, and I actually do not think we have already tried this on a SmartSeq2 data set. Correct me if I'm wrong, Kelly and Hector. I think I, I have tried TradeSeq on, on SmartSeq2 data sets. Uh, without issues. Um, I think the, the main difference, and that's something we implement in TradeSeq, is if you have a lot of cells, um, you could get significant results with very small effect sizes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a log fault change cutoff in all the test function, um, which I would really heavily recommend using, um, yeah. especially as the data set size is increased. Yeah, that's that's one thing that I I just want to emphasize is I've seen that a fair amount where with lots of cells you do get 
uh, significant results with very small effect sizes. So using that effect size cutoff can be very useful. So I, I also have a question um, that is maybe related to the um, um, computational issues that you were talking about earlier. So I guess, but I'm not sure, but I guess the negative binomial gum will be uh, slower to fit than a sort of Gaussian uh, gum or regular gum. Um, in your experience, does it make a lot of uh, practical difference? Um, I can see the theoretical advantage of having the negative binomial gum, but uh, have you have you tried on trying to make the data as Gaussian as possible and then do a, a regular gum? Uh, as I recall, when we were originally developing it, that was what we tried. And and I think we did see a pretty big difference, uh, largely because of the, the number of zeros. Uh, yeah. we make, it, it's hard to make that look Gaussian. Fair enough. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah, I guess for UMI data, you, you have real, really discrete, like zero, one, two, three. I mean, you can transform yeah. it as you want, but there's going to be, yeah, discrete data anyway. <laughs> and did you try a Poisson? Maybe that's going to be faster. I, I, I believe I, I did try that, but um, I, I was getting a lot of false positives. And, and I, I think because you, you are not capturing the over dispersion. Yeah. So another question from the audience, do you use the imbalance score for differential trajectory analysis across the conditions? Perhaps, perhaps I missed it. So I can take that one. Uh, the imbalance score is um, a visual tool um, that kind of, for now, informs the decision. Um, it's in the workflow because it's the first thing we developed. Um, and we are working on having some more uh, principled test on whether you should fit a common trajectory or not. But that's a kind of a hard question to, to answer. So for now, if you, if you have a data set that has uh, this, this question, um, I would just recommend using a lot of different visualization to see um, if you should fit a common trajectory or not. Uh, I must also say we are kind of biased on fitting a common trajectory uh, because it's going to be much more robust. Uh, you're going to use a lot more cells to infer the trajectory. Um, and also, it's going to make the downstream analysis much better because you can actually compare within the lineages, um, especially given the fact that we have other tools downstream to still detect changes, like the differential progression and the differential expression. Um, for all those reasons, we kind of more highly recommend fitting a common trajectory when in doubt. But I don't know if that answered your question or not. Perfect. Yeah, I see thumbs up emojis, yeah. so I guess so. <laughs> All right, another question. Have you tried, is it applicable to use SC transform or other VST methods instead of TMM inside TradeSeq? If it is not applicable, what is the reason? Um, so, so I can try this one. So <clears throat> I, we have we haven't actually tried it. We we did discuss trying it, <laughs> uh, but we we haven't yet. Um, I I think it could work, but um, I, I think it goes a little bit back to to Davide's question, where if you do, you know, it's it the, the, these are basically methods that try to make your data look a little bit more Gaussian, and and then use a Gaussian to um, a Gaussian assumption in the model against uh, instead of a count distribution. So I, I think it's worth a try, uh, but we haven't tried it yet for now. I think maybe kind of related uh, to that point is part of our approach is to always go back to the raw counts when we're doing trade seek or when we're doing differential expression in general. Um, and that's just because uh, Pseudo time is, is such a constructed value. It, it takes so many steps of normalization, dimensionality reduction, clustering, pseudo time, uh, trajectory inference to get to a pseudo time value that I think it's a really important check on our process to then go back to the raw counts for differential expression and trade seek. 
So we have another question. Have you tried something like Wasserstein, 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 who knows, distances instead of KS test to check for differences in the pseudo time distributions between groups? I have to say I am really ignorant. I don't know what Wasserstein distances are, but maybe you guys know. <laughs> I've tried Wasserstein distances, not for comparing the pseudo time distribution, but comparing the distribution of cells in the reduced dimension, uh, dimensional space. I found that it's way too sensitive to small differences in the reduced dimension space, and that you're going to have a cluster of 20 cells on the side that is just one condition. I mean, this is something I just uh, in, in the about right now. Talk. Oh, you left, sorry. You, you I thought you were done, but uh, uh, I just left. It's like, yeah, <laughs> I could see your lips moving and no sound coming out of it, which is probably my end. Um, so I, for the pseudo time distribution, it, it might work. Um, it's more like the KS test is working, and so we haven't looked much more beyond that. So I guess this is kind of related to the distinct uh, question of before, but uh, could you use distinct to kind of generalize your approach to multiple sample per condition? Yeah, I think we could. I, I think ba based on my, my current understanding of, of distinct, which is based on Simone's talk on, on Monday, uh, it, it, it seems pretty related to the Kolmogorov Smirnov test where um, it, it, it sums up all the differences across the CDFs while Kolmogorov Smirnov looks at the maximum distance, I believe. Um, but I, I definitely agree that if we have multiple samples per condition, then this thing would be a very good alternative. The difficulty would be to have, I think, from what I understand from this thing, you need to have repetitive samples that are kind of equivalent and maybe I'm mistaken. But usually the design that people do when they do samples is they have like sample from early in the trajectory and then sample from late in the trajectory. Uh, and I don't know if this thing would work in that design format. Well, we have Mark in the audience, so maybe he can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> so another question, is TraceSeq run only with the highly variable genes or not necessarily? Again, maybe I missed this when you went through the workflow. Um, no, we, we don't recommend TradeSeq to, we don't recommend really to run TradeSeq with only the highly variable genes. I think that's something that's very useful for, for dimensionality reduction or uh, things like that. But for differential expression, I, I think the, the idea is that we wanted to do, we want to do this in a, in a kind of unbiased way. So looking at, um, you know, the, the reasonable set of genes we think might have some signal would be a good idea. And I, we would not recommend filtering only the highly variable genes. Hmm. Kind of a very of, of the back computation I use is to pick like a thousand gene for highly variable, but usually more like 10,000 for trade seek. Uh, that's very rough, but just to give an idea of kind of what we've been doing. Do you see any kind of bias in the genes that you typically detect as, as uh, significance? I mean, is it usually like highly expressed genes or lowly expressed genes? Is there some, um, yeah, bias in there in the what you're able to to, to detect? So in 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 my experience, that we do see that we're often picking up highly expressed genes, uh, which I think is natural because the relative uncertainty is a little bit smaller there. And and something we've also seen, which, which which I think relates back to the full change cutoff, is that if you know if if we didn't use a full change cutoff, for example, with the association test, and you're we having tens of thousands of cells, we would see you know the, these uh, biologically pretty meaningless but kind of wiggly patterns along pseudo time that were pretty stable. Um, those could pop up as well if we had a lot of cells. Yeah. yeah. 
So we have a question from Mark um, Robinson, who says that uh, he just joined. I sorry to put you on the spot <laughs> earlier, um, but uh, he just wanted to follow up on the discussion about replicates. Um, and his question is: Do I understand that TradeSeq is a one versus one comparison? Um, may maybe we can do a raise hand, so so we can have. A, yeah. Mark, yeah. do you want to raise your hand? We can bring you up on the stage. Maybe he didn't want it's, to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Trade seek isn't really trade seek is, is just a, a differential expression method for for uh, kind of dynamic single cell systems comparing uh, gene expression within or between different uh, lineages. Um, but the the one versus one comparison we were having is that here. We, we had one sample in a control condition and one sample consisting of thousands of cells in a, oh, in a TGF beta condition. And there we were using the coma. Hey, Mark. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, we were using the one sample versus one sample comparison in a, in a situation where we were comparing distributions of pseudotime between different conditions. And we only had one sample per condition, which is why we were using the Kolmogorov Smirnov test. And then the question came, if you have multiple samples per condition, can we use distinct? And right. We'll and I, I mean, I think the concept of distinct you could use, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. I think the concept of distinct maybe could be used, you know, kind of like just, you know, getting differences along the, the, the time axis. But I guess, I mean, the comparison is a little bit different in the sense that distinct is comparing full distributions, right? Whereas, I guess, your progression along the time course is not really a, I mean, maybe it is, maybe because it is normalized to, to one, right? The, the area is normalized to one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a density. Maybe we can share maybe the, could work, actually. Show the show the plots that might make things clear. Um, so I'll share the plot we had. Yeah, sorry to hijack the discussion. But no worries. I mean, it's, that, that's what the discussion is for. So this was the for the distributions we are comparing, where we we kind of so so we had two conditions, and this is the right. density of pseudo times for all cells in each condition. Um, and right here we were using and each, a homogram. And each curve is normalized to have an area of one, I guess. Is that right? Uh, I, I guess it's, it's, it's just the density uh, okay. of the pseudo time values. Yeah. So. so actually, yeah, maybe maybe distinct could be used if you did have replicates. Have, have you ever come across the situation where you do have kind of replicated mock? I think I got. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I lost you for a second. Okay. So I, I haven't seen it in the data sets we're working with. Uh, I think it might be we, it might be in some of the other data sets we're working with. Um, but I, I, I definitely wouldn't think it's a rare situation. I, I, I would think it happens. OK. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know what, what the others think. I mean, we've been kind of looking for, we've been kind of looking for a data set with this, but I, I haven't um, been able to nail one down myself. Yeah, no, I think I also don't uh, remember seeing any uh, publicly available examples like this. But I, I kind of uh, imagine it's going to become more common. Yeah, it's certainly it's certainly easy to imagine such a data set. But yes, I think we just haven't encountered it yet. Can I ask another question while I'm on the stage? Yes, of course. <laughs> um, do you uh, do you have much experience with data sets where you have kind of like a combination of discrete, like kind of different cell types, but then a more continuous trajectory within one subset? Because um, that's the kind of scenario that we've seen a little bit, but we haven't kind of formalized it into this, you know, such a such a framework. So it's more just uh, an idea. Um, yeah, this is actually something that. Uh, that Slingshot is, is getting better at, um, at handling. Uh, so we do have a, um, a method for detecting discrete pieces. Um, they could be discrete trajectories or just like a single cluster disconnected from a trajectory or you know whatever else, you know, different disconnected parts. Um, and that's that's always been there, but it hasn't, really been a, a focus until recently. 
Um, so basically just setting a, a cutoff when we build the, the minimum spanning tree on clusters in Slingshot, um, setting a cutoff on like, you know, if you're, if an edge is this long, then we don't actually make that edge. And that's how you get discrete pieces. Um, I've also been working with Aaron Lunn on um, using mutual nearest neighbors to calculate the distances between clusters. And so that could be a really good way of um, basically ensuring that you don't draw any connections between clusters that aren't actually connected, or at least between clusters that don't have any cells in between them that would look like a transition between them. So you could potentially end up with two completely different MST, like minimum spanning trees, and so build like, yeah, yeah. That, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And so right now, right now we've got the sort of just rule of thumb in place where like if a distance, I, I forget exactly what it is, but like if a distance is more than three times the average distance of the minimum spanning tree, then you don't draw that edge. Um, but I think, I think once we implement the mutual nearest neighbor based distance metric, we'll be able to come up with something much better than that. But if they then want uh, like a trajectory within, uh, let's say, a cell type, you would need to kind of over cluster, right? So that that cell type actually splits up into many different clusters. Uh, yeah. Well, potentially. I mean, it'll it'll depend, I guess, on how we decide to implement it. But right now, if you just speed slingshot one cluster, it will find a lineage because that's what it does. So. Oh, interesting. That's, that's I never not thought of that. It's uh, not necessarily the ideal behavior. We might want to change that, especially when we're dealing with cases where there's uh, single clusters that are disconnected from trajectory. So basically, like slingshot on a single cluster would be just the principal curve, like a single principal yeah. curve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it's a reasonable. Yeah. The idea was to, case. Yeah. to be a generalization of principal curves, and that's what a principal curve does. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs>